Chowdhury is the Associate Dean for Research Data Management and Head of the Open Source Program Office at Johns Hopkins University. JHU took a, a leaf out of industry's book and formed an open source pro, uh, project office. You might think of it as a universal interface between an institution and the open source community. Uh, if you want to make comments or ask questions, please use the hashtag OpenAperio21 on Twitter. If you want to ask questions via the pod web page you're viewing through, you should find a chat window in that page. Said, thanks for joining us and over to you. Thank you, Ian. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and be part of the Barrier 21, uh, and it's nice to catch up with you. Uh, so I will be talking about the Open Source Programs Office at Johns Hopkins, but also more broadly uh, about Open Source Programs Offices in higher education. And I think Ian said it perfectly that in many ways this is an interface between the open source activity within an institution, within a university, and uh, a way to engage with the broader open source community as well. Uh, I noticed that Deb Bryan is a speaker in the next session, and she has very rightly and wisely said that it's ultimately about changing the culture. Uh, but as you might know, any of you who've been at universities know that that's not a small task. So uh, I'd like to talk about some of the things we're going to try to move in that direction. Uh, Ian mentioned that this is something we are uh, adapting, or if you will, borrowing from the industry, uh, the private sector context. So there, these OSPOs, as we call them, which are programs offices, they existed for some time uh, in corporations. And it's not only tech companies, as you might imagine, uh, the Googles, the Microsofts, the Red Hats, but uh, American Airlines, uh, Walmart, so on. So anyone using open source, which I don't need to tell this audience, of course, is, uh, is pervasive at this point. Uh, has thought about uh, how do we manage open source and how do we coordinate the activity, how do we think about it from a legal perspective, a policy perspective, an engineering perspective. So a lot of the emphasis of these uh, private sector or corporate hospitals have been around those kinds of operational uh, entities, but that, that's expanding as well. So we did learn a good deal uh, from looking at existing hospitals. There's a fairly long history of them at this point. There's a group that's uh, out of the Linux Foundation called the To Do Group. Uh, which is kind of a, an affinity group or uh, for birds of a feather. Uh, so we looked at a lot of their documentation. And I've often said, uh, as we've been working on this topic, that companies and universities and even municipalities will have a CIO or an HR office or a legal office. Uh, and there's a common set of uh, you know, a per, a perspectives and functions for those offices. But then each have their own unique perspectives in universities. We have to think about uh, patient data or student data, for example, that you might not name a company or a city. So taking that common foundation, but then adapting it and applying it uh, in the university context is really what we've, we've been doing over the last uh, you know, 18 to 24 months. And a lot of that is really out of uh, something called the OSPO Plus Plus Network. Um, so very much a group, uh, a growing community that's dedicated to exactly what I just described. Uh, how do we take the OSPO as, as an entity, uh, a corporate entity, uh, and start to think about it in these different contexts, uh, universities and cities, uh, and so on. So uh, I am seeing something about the volume. If that's still an issue, let me know. I'll, I'll try to speak up. I'm using AirPods, but I can also uh, not use those if they aren't working well. So uh, we have created the OSPO. Just to let you know, uh, there's a web page. Uh, of course, something becomes real when, when there's a web, web page associated with it. I will share a list of the links uh, at the end of the talk. But uh, we put it out there so that our local community uh, can see this and can start to uh, access the services that we're starting to build and start to build a community uh, around open source. So what are some of the things um, you know that we've sort of propagated within the university, if you will. Uh, the first bullet item basically says it's a new organizational API that looks at software as a primary research object. And what, what do I mean by that? So uh, from January to June of 2020, and actually a little bit earlier and later than that, I was a fellow in our provost office uh, looking at open scholarship. And one of the important assertions that I made is open scholarship includes articles, data, and software. Uh, and that all three of them should be treated as primary research objects. We've spent a lot of time and energy around articles, uh, a fair amount of time around data, but I would say relatively less around open source software as its own primary research object. And any time you're talking about a research output or a research object in a university setting, it activates various parts of the 
university, of course, uh, that you typically work with when you're talking about articles, data, grants, and so on. And the idea is that it's not easy for an external entity, uh, you know, a company, uh, a city, a municipality, a community, to figure out where to go within a university if you want to engage around open source software. Uh, we're basically saying the OSPO is a good place to do that. The uh, OSPO is a, a good first starting point to say, I'm interested in what open source software is being produced by the university or potentially partnering or contributing or consuming uh, and that the OSPO becomes a place that that happens. So the way to do that, of course, is through best practices, not having idiosyncratic practices or ad hoc practices or specific practices, but trying to do things in a way uh, that resonate with the community that, that you're trying to work with, for example, uh, and that empowers the kind of collaboration engagement that I think is really critical. Uh, and again, I'm preaching to the choir here uh, around open source software. And it builds on these three big pillars of universities around research, education, and translation. And by translation, I, sometimes people immediately think of tech transfer, uh, which is one way of doing translation, but I'm thinking of it more broadly which is how does the research within a university get used in educational contexts, get used in terms of working with your local city or, or used uh, in terms of student projects and things like that. So the OSPO has taken a really important role in that and I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the talk. So some of the things that we've done uh, through the OSPO in terms of building this foundation uh, is we have uh, signed and managed the GitHub Enterprise account and you may think, what's the big deal about that? Well, big deal is we didn't have one before. Uh, I'm told that it's not all that common. Uh, we get at least US universities. And it's a, it's a key part of what we're, uh, what we're using to try and build an inventory of the open source software. Uh, I, I say this you know, publicly, and sometimes I'm asked, you know, it's a little bit embarrassing to admit we don't have such an inventory. Uh, of, of, of all the open source software Hopkins, but increasing them, beginning to realize this this may be a challenge in many places. Uh, I don't think it's quite, it's not trivial to show up at a university and say, can you tell me all the open source software you're producing? So we're starting with that kind of foundational level uh, you know, activity. And we are working with a company called Liturgia, uh, which has very strong connections to the open source community. Uh, taking that inventory or the, the growing inventory of the data and providing sort of visual ways of looking at it, dashboards or, and running analytics uh, and so on. And there's a group called the Chaos Framework, which I believe is community health analytics for open source software uh, that's coming up with metrics to measure the, melt, uh, the health sorry, of open source software. Uh, so Viturgia, some of the principles of Viturgia are a key part of that, so we're, we're trying to connect with that as well. We have a grant from the Sloan Foundation to run what's called a free and open source of FOSS contributor fund. Uh, if you're familiar with this, the idea is uh, your community within uh, an organization votes on open source software that are most important, either in terms of use or dependencies, supply chain issues, things like that. Uh, and then as a community, we then fund those projects. We have a, a monthly uh, mechanism to provide funding for them. Uh, so we are implementing the first of those within a university context. And a lot of interesting challenges around who is a contributor in the university, uh, you know, what constitutes you know, uh, Hopkins open source software versus even community source software and so on. Uh, there's a couple of projects that I'll talk about a little bit in, in a couple of slides, the tests and the public access submission system that are directly getting support uh, from this OSPO. And then I'll uh, end with a discussion about something called semesters of code which is what we're launching through the Institute uh, for Applied Open Source, which is uh, a layer on top of the OSPO. So one other thing I want to mention before I talk about the projects specifically is we've become members of the Eclipse Foundation. So the OSPO led the effort to, to do this. Uh, and it's particularly important for the public access submission system, which I'll talk about. But I think it's also important because it's a strong signal to our university community that we are now tied through a membership, if you will, to the open source community through an Eclipse Foundation. And this is not exclusive. We're talking to the Linux Foundation. Uh, we'd be very keen to look at other kinds of foundations, but trying to convey to the university, there is this external community that organizes itself in these, through these foundations. And we need to become part of that uh, rather than sort of being our own little silo in the open source community and, and, and not knowing what's happening more broadly. 
So let me talk a little bit about Lutes. Uh, you can see a, a, a URL there that talks about this story. Um, Lutes is a platform, an open source platform that was developed by the city of Paris uh, over many years with significant amounts of funding. It is used to provide hundreds of digital services for the citizens of Paris. Uh, many of the things that you typically do as a citizen, I need to file a ticket for an issue, I need to file for a permit, uh, things of that nature, but also some, I would say, fairly novel and interesting types of things as well, something called participatory budgeting, where 5% of uh, Paris's budget is allocated to direct con uh, input from citizens, direct voting uh, and, and uh, uh, choices. So um, the, I, I, I don't exactly remember the number, but it's a significant num amount of funding. I believe it's something like 100 million euros has been allocated through this participatory budgeting. So citizens in Paris saying, this is what I care about, so the, the funds should be going to that. Uh, we've been working with the team in Paris, uh, in the CIO's office uh, that, that manages the test, and a local community center in West Baltimore called the St. Francis Neighborhood Center. Uh, and what we're doing is basically piloting a Lutes instance for uh, St. Francis for, for their digital services and for their community. Uh, they, they are a very energetic and, and visionary kind of community center that has a smart set, uh, a digital strategy that includes a, a smart center, a lab uh, with computers and digital services. And Lutes is going to be a key part of that. So you have uh, the city of Paris, Johns Hopkins University, and a community center in West Baltimore working together uh, on this test platform. So any of you who've tried to sign MOUs or agreements um, with university, between universities, uh, or, or, but imagine a university, a city in another country and a community center in your city. Uh, I think you know how complicated that could be. One of the most interesting points I can raise is the open source license for Utes is the framework under which we are operating. So we have not signed any MOUs, we have not signed any agreements. Uh, we're just saying there is a license, that is the license under which this collaboration and this partnership occurs. So that kind of seamless, uh, you know, frictionless, uh, or at least less friction way of working together is a really important part of the story in addition to the specific things we're doing uh, around the test itself. The public access submission system or PASS is something that we developed uh, at Hopkins in partnership with Harvard and MIT. It is a platform to support uh, federal funding agencies in the United States, uh, public access compliance and institutional open access compliance. And what do I mean by that? Uh, if I receive a grant from the National Institutes of Health, uh, I'm required to get a copy of the articles from those grants into PubMed Central, their article repository. That may happen through a publisher, um, but PASS is a system that allows you to do that directly as a researcher, as a principal investigator and to simultaneously submit that article into your institutional repository. So at the same time, a copy of the article goes into both those platforms. And we have, uh, I have a, a current grant with the U.S. National Science Foundation to generalize this to work with other uh, federal funders. So the ultimate aim is I have a grant from NSF and NIH, and I have an article and I have to submit it into both of those repositories and my institutional repository if I wish and PASS allows for that simultaneous kind of submission. Uh, so it's very much uh, a system to reduce the burden on researchers to help them with their compliance uh, with, with funding requirements and institutional open, open access policies. It's, a, it's an open source platform. Uh, what's probably most important to share in this context is we have submitted a proposal to the Eclipse Foundation to make it an official product. Uh, and the, the main drivers for this are that we believe in order for PASS to be used by other institutions, to be supported by federal funders, the best way to do that is to make it uh, an Eclipse Foundation. And again, insert your favorite foundation if you wish, uh, you know, Eclipse Foundation product, so that it's a strong signal that while it may have been developed at Hopkins, we are moving it into the community and we are asking for the community uh, to, to work on this. And, and again, I'm sure many people in the audience are familiar with this kind of work or have been involved in similar kinds of things like Sakai and so on. Uh, but we're doing this as an institution working with an open source foundation with support from our provost office, with support from federal funders, uh, you know, with support from other universities. So getting that kind of coordination around a particular platform, uh, again, you're seeing this theme of 
open source is not just about the code, it's not just about the particular technology you're using, but it's a way of working together, building a community and, and partnering together. So I mentioned this Institute for Applied Open Source. Uh, the OSPO, as I spoke about earlier, is really focused much more on the operational side of things, but that how you leverage and move the open source into research and education and translation. We're doing that through this Institute for Applied Open Source. It was launched uh, in partnership with the Department of Computer Science. Uh, the chair of computer science endorsed the idea and we raised this with the provost at, at the university. We've done a few things already. Uh, one is a series of webinars and events under the auspices of, of OSPO++, which I described previously. Uh, and these range from, uh, you know, how do OSPOs work in the private sector? How do they work in municipalities? How can they work in universities? To legal issues, to uh, best practices, and so on. Uh, but what I'm really excited about is something called Semesters of Code. Uh, these are immersive ex students, experiences for students to learn about software engineering uh, in an open source way and to learn uh, about the non-technical aspects of open source as well. The, policy, the business models, you know, things of that nature, the community building, the maintainers, things like that. Uh, we are obviously building on similar types of things like hackathons and Google Summer of Code, but this is very much embedded into the educational experience. So students at Hopkins would take this as part of their education, as part of um, you know, their sort of internship programs, if you will. Uh, we had a mini course this past January in between semesters uh, taught by Stephen Wally, uh, who's a, a principal at Microsoft. It's very well received. Uh, Stephen has decades of experience in software engineering and at least 20 years of experience in open source. It's a very interesting metaphor of cooking. Uh, if you think about cooking for yourself, it's a very you know, individual kind of activity by definition. If you cook for someone else, then you have to probably uh, you know, ask about dietary preferences and how you do things together. Imagine that being a family, imagine that being Thanksgiving dinner, imagine that being catering. Uh, you suddenly start to get more complex. You have to be more formal about your requirements gathering. You can't make assumptions. You can't do things my way. And then imagine you know, cooking for thousands of people, and what it means to produce food at that scale. So that kind of metaphor of what you go from an individual you know, programmer sitting at the keyboard to producing industrial scale software is a key part of this and done through the lens of open source. So in the fall of 2021, we will be teaching a semester long course now uh, where students will be involved in this and will start to learn about the software engineering practices uh, and making actual contributions to actual projects, working with the communities that are using the projects. One thing we hear repeatedly from our students is I need more practical, real world, hands on experience. We're hearing that from their employers. Uh, you know, I mentioned we're working with Microsoft. so. Uh, you know, Microsoft has said Hopkins has lots of good students, bright, bright students, but when we hire them, it takes some amount of weeks to sort of reorient their way of thinking to do this kind of collaborative software engineering. So we're trying to prepare the students not only to learn more about software engineering, but be better candidates when they apply for jobs or even go on to graduate school, uh, whatever they choose. This, this mantra you see at the bottom, open source as a verb, not only a noun, uh, really resonates with this theme I keep talking about. You learn much about how open source works in these non-technical ways uh, when you do these kinds of things. And not only that, you know, the product is not the only thing you should be focused on when working on open source. Some of the projects that we have as candidates for semesters of code uh, include the tests and pass, the ones I just described. Uh, Semesterly is a very interesting uh, platform that was developed by students at Hopkins. Uh, it is now used at other institutions, I believe, and it basically helps you choose courses and understand scheduling conflicts and things like that. And I think they have ambitions for it to be more of you know, sort of a, a time management kind of tool, if you will. Open Cravat is a, a National Institute of Health funded effort uh, run out of Hopkins. Uh, I am not a biomedical researcher, but what I hear is it's kind of like an app store uh, for biomedical tools uh, and apps and software. The OHDSI, uh, which is listed here, is a multi-institutional, multi-software uh, kind of entity, and there are many, many potential software um, projects that could be uh, candidates from there. And then finally, uh, the United Nations Financial Crime Data Challenge, uh, 
Uh, so the UN is very interested in open source, does a lot around open source, is thinking about creating an OSPO, uh, and has this, this set of challenges around open source software to deal with financial crime. Uh, and that could potentially be a, a candidate as well. So the reason I'm showing this list is to show you sort of the diversity uh, and the range of options that students will have. Some of the things that we are directly involved with, some like past that we directly created or semester lead by the students, uh, other things that are grant funded, faculty driven, uh, community driven, or even you know, internationally driven by the UN. So trying to give exposure to a whole different set of kinds of projects, uh, different kinds of activities, and uh, have a matching kind of program, right? So you know, some students may say, I'm pre-med, therefore I wanna walk on open for that. Uh, or some of them may say, it's really frustrating for me to figure out my classes I wanna work on semesterly. Or these are particular technologies I care about. So I'd rather be focused on this kind of platform because of the technology choices. Or uh, the community that I'm working with. You know, I really care about Baltimore uh, and West Baltimore and I care about the kinds of project uh, problems that cities in the U.S. might be dealing with, so I'll work on the tests. So you can see it's not only you sit down and you learn about software engineering, but you kind of go through this process of learning open source is pervasive. It's being used in lots of different places for lots of different functions, lots of different kind of problems. And how do you find yourself and how do you fit yourself into that as well? And for the projects, you know, we're basically saying, in many ways, we're going to help you with the onboarding problem. Uh, and you know what do I mean by that is you have this open source project, you want to get other people involved, but there, there's a steep learning curve or there's a barrier. Um, there, there's sort of a knowledge gap, there's a, a practice gap, there's just the anxiety of I'm new to this and how do I work on something that I don't know or from people I don't know. So the projects will have a better sense of what it means to prepare themselves to take contributions from others, right? So the students get the benefit of learning how to contribute, the projects get the benefit of making it easier uh, for students to contribute. And we're looking at things all the way from, uh, you know, sort of bug fixes, documentation, uh, important things, but that don't necessarily require that deep kind of technology skill if you don't have it. Um, but then all the way to, you might make, you know, a feature, uh, a new feature or fix a feature in one of these platforms. So that range of kind of experiences is, is what we really so uh, I have a few pointers and acknowledgements, and I actually have three screens, so I'm just going to scroll through them. I want to make sure the font was large. Um, this has really been uh, a, a team effort. Uh, I am the one presenting, but there have been many, many people involved. And I do want to mention Jacob Green and Denise Cooper in particular. Uh, Denise Cooper is a very well-known leader in the open source community. He's done a lot of amazing things. <laughs> Jacob Green is a uh, Hopkins alumnus, who is a member of our Computer Science Advisory Board. It was actually his idea to launch the OSPO at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and then you'll see a few of the uh, links to some of the things that I described uh, in the talk. I would encourage you to check uh, or, or you know, join the OSPO++ Plus Plus network if you're interested in this, um, because there's a, a really interesting growing community there. And uh, as I mentioned, the Turgia and the Boss Contributor Fund uh, are things we're doing with the Sloan Foundation uh, grant. And this is the final set here. And with that, I think we may have some time for questions if there are. Um, so I'd be happy to take those. Thanks, Aid. That was a great talk. Um, I'm particularly impressed by the semester of code idea and embedding open source in the curriculum with that kind of diversity is very exciting indeed. There may be some Aperio projects that are interested in uh, in talking to you about yeah, that'd that. Be great. That'd um, be great. No, we'd welcome that. While we're waiting for questions to come in, I mean, I, I think I understand completely why there's a focus on making institutional intellectual property far more visible and surfacing it to external parties and encouraging the external use of IP. But do you envisage an accompanying kind of reversal of that role? Is there an OSPO role in software procurement for a, a university, do you think? Uh, like to give that a, a, a thought or two? Yeah, very good question. Um, the short answer is yes. And one has to be careful how to present this 
because I think fundamentally there's a couple of dimensions to that. One is a risk mitigation component, uh, and another is a sustainability component. So one of the things that a lot of the people in the private sector have been mentioning to me repeatedly is the digital supply chain, right? Is how am I dependent on open source in terms of just delivering all the services and, and functions that we deliver? I don't think universe. I'll speak for Hopkins. How's that? I don't think Hopkins is a really good idea. <laughs> what our dependencies are uh, in terms of this digital supply chain, um, and we we don't have yet. Uh, and I'll say yet policies in place right now or recommendations in place right now for individual PIs, departments, units, whatever, about you're interested in using open source. Here are some questions you should ask <laughs> uh, when you when you make those choices. And we, you know, we all know this, we're not telling faculty thou shalt do the following, but at least ask these questions. Uh, and if you don't know the answer to those questions, then maybe the OSPO can help you. <laughs> uh, and we have access to people who can help you so um, we, we, we've done that around data, right? And I think one of the observations I didn't go into in this particular talk is a lot of the challenges we faced with data management in universities, um, we have an opportunity to reflect on those and try to do them in a different way around open source software. Uh, and one of the big benefits we have is that the private sector has actually done a lot in this space, right? There are open source licenses that they have developed and sanctioned as official licenses. There are best practices. There are ways they figure out how to share uh, and procure and, and manage software. So I, and you're absolutely right that it's not only about here's what we have, how how can we become contributors to other things, but how do we consume open source software? So really key part of the Osmo. Yeah, thanks a lot. There's a question in from Jim Helwig of Wisconsin Madison. JHU is clearly quite a ways down the road with a robust Ospo. Do you have tips on how we can start to advocate for or get started on creating an Ospo in our own campus? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, and as you might imagine, it's popping up even more and more. Um, so the Ospo Plus Plus network that I mentioned is a great place to start. We have not been good about linking to the materials we've been producing. And I, I just sent an email this week saying, I'm going to be talking about the OSPO++ Plus Plus network. We really need to get our resources onto the website. So um, we're, we're hoping as early as next week, when you go there, it won't just be you can join, but you can actually see the, the resources, which I think is a great place to start. There are these bi-weekly conversations that can be as well, so I encourage you to join. It's a really welcoming and open group. Um, but we do, we are creating uh, documents like, what does an OSPO at a university look like? What does it do? Um, and we've had a lot of uh, discussions around that and had experts uh, talk about this. So that, that's a really good place to start. I'd like to believe uh, the OSPO++ Plus Plus network in some sense is developing a protocol so that the OSPOs have at least some common way of working together. And we don't have one at Hopkins and one at Institution A and Institution B and so on, and then ultimately realize, uh oh, we can't work together. Um, so the OSPO++ Plus Plus network is a good place to start. That's great. Thanks very much. And, and do make sure that we get those links and we'll circulate them in the Aperio Thank community you. and put them on the website. Great. That'll be perfect. Thank you. Well, that's been a really tremendously exciting half hour. Thanks very much for being with us uh, again. Uh, I'm going to move on to the next point on the agenda. I hope folks will stay with us uh, because we're going to spend a little bit of time celebrating some of the volunteers that make a peri of the community it is and who we rely on. So just a second while we change slides. There we go. Okay. Uh, so an exciting part of the agenda every year uh, when we celebrate, as I said, the Aperio Fellows. And these are folks who are active in a range of Aperio communities. But this year, I think they demonstrate particularly great diversity and commitment to the communities that they're involved in. So let's welcome this year's Aperio Fellows. I'm not going to read all of every slide. Uh, if you want to go to the Aperio website, you can find these. But first, 
first fellow, David P. Bauer from the University of Dayton, who many of you will know has been active in Sakai and Sugi for some considerable time. David, congratulations and welcome to Aperio Fellowship. Uh, Maximiliano Lira del Canto from the University of Cologne, uh, active in the OpenCast community where he's a software developer and consultant. Maximiliano, well, welcome to Aperio Fellowship. Olivier Gebe from uh, HSA Montreal, who's uh, one of the architects of Karuta. I must apologize to Olivier. Big Blue Button, you know, it does a fantastic job of converting slides into PDF. Never seen that happen before. My version of the PDF. Olivier is upright. Now we're taking a sidelong look at him. Never mind that. Olivier, welcome to Aperio Fellowship and thanks for your contribution. And finally, Nikki Masaro Kaufman from Penn State, who's active in Elms LN. Elms LN is a next generation learning environment. Uh, congratulations, Nikki, and welcome to Aperio Fellowship. And thanks also to Anthony White from the University of Michigan, who uh, acts as chair of the Fellows Appointment Panel every year. Uh, and thanks to those panel members, Wilma Hodges, Matt Jones, Stephen Marquard, and Janice Smith. It's a tough job. Uh, there are many uh, folks put forward for a Perio Fellowship. This group of folks does a great job. Uh, they're all ex-fellows, by the way. Now, I have some quick announcements, if you stay with me. We'd love to have one more lightning talk in today's final lightning talk round. If you've been inspired by what you've seen and heard to provide a quick talk, please email aperio coordinator at concentra-cms.com as soon as possible. The conference doesn't end today. There are workshops scheduled for Thursday and Friday. On Thursday morning, uh, assessing the organizational health of open source software, subject which is dear to many of our hearts. Uh, you can find details in the program Thursday and Friday at 11 a.m. U.S. Eastern. The U Portal team are having a roadmap discussion and first contribution workshops. Make sure you join us in a few moments at uh, on the hour to see our final keynote. Uh, take a, a bit of time to stretch and get up and move around but our final keynote at 11 eastern uh, features deborah bryant from red hat lucy appert from nyu and Anne marie scott from aperio we're going to talk about the pandemic inclusion and open source and education uh, so join us then have a bit of a break clear your head and come back with lots of questions for that panel thanks a lot